Dr. Bell graduated from BYU with a Bachelor's of Science degree in zoology. So he qualifies as an alumnus and we can give him this honor, yay. <laughs> After he graduated here, he went on to the University of California at San Diego to receive his PhD. And then he did postdoctoral research uh, in the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Virginia. He came back to BYU and joined the faculty of the Department of Zoology in 1990. And when I came here as faculty in the department in 1998, uh, I met John for the first time and we became colleagues. Um, soon thereafter, he became chair of the department. So John was my chair for a number, number of years until um, the year 2002 when he became an associate dean for the then College of Bi Agriculture and uh, Biology and Agriculture, which subsequently became known as the College of Life Sciences. In 2008, he became Dean of Undergraduate Education here at BYU. And then in 2015, he left the BYU campus to become the Vice President of Academics at BYU Hawaii. So now he has the tough gig of living in Hawaii. He told me he loves it. Um, John is an outstanding teacher. He championed active learning in the classroom while he was here at BYU. He's published research about the benefits of active learning and creative testing. And uh, he's received a number of teaching awards, including the Carl, Carl G. Mazur Distinguished Teaching Award here at BYU. His research involves uh, the uh, biophysics of plasma membranes. He's a bi biophysicist. He studied the properties and dynamics of plasma membrane for his whole career. He's well published and he is an excellent mentor of undergraduate and graduate students. He has a, uh, he has a wide range of interests including scuba diving and seashell collecting. In fact, while he was here, he was the curator of mollusks at the Bean Museum. He told me today he actually continues at that role. He says, well, at least his key still works there. He was just up there doing some work with some <laughs> shellfish. He's a musician, he's a playwright, and he's been active in Boy Scouting. So uh, I'd like to invite John to come up. We have a presentation for him. And this won't be a surprise to him, I don't think, because John has been here for some of these in the past. But I'd like to show uh, this, which is a cougar statue. This was created by Dan Fairbanks, who used to be a faculty member here. In fact, I think he was dean of undergraduate education, wasn't he? He was. Before you. He was my predecessor. Before yeah. John. Uh, and Dan Fairbanks' grandfather, Arvin, Fairbanks is a famous LDS um, sculptor. In fact, he did the cougar that's out in front of Cougar Stadium. So John, we're gonna present you to this. I'm not gonna <laughs> hand it to you, but I'm gonna just congratulate you. Thank you. So, so John is gonna spot, speak to us about uh, Heavenly Father, are you really there? A scientist wants to know, and I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to John. And I'm going to just get rid of this. Oh. Do you have I think we may have just created panic in the people. <laughs> Are you planning on this one? Because he's got another one over there. You were going to uh, use that one for the audio for this. Can you walk around with it? Maybe I'll just stay here. I'll just stay here. I'll okay. stay here. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> well, brothers and sisters, aloha. Aloha. Thank you. I, uh, my wife and I have quickly gotten in the habit of doing that for every single time we stand up in front of a group of more than two people. <laughs> One time, not, not too many months after we had arrived in, in Laie, I had to uh, 
I had the assignment to give the uh, closing prayer at an alumni event out, out on, the, on the beach. And uh, so we had all these alumni, and I stood up to give the closing prayer, and I just stood up and I said, brothers and sisters, uh, let us pray. <laughs> <laughs> So it, uh, it certainly is, is the, the greeting that we all prefer. Well, first and foremost, I just want to thank uh, Jim. Where did you go? I'm over here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Jim and the college for this uh, honor, for inviting me and hosting me to come here. Certainly that uh, caught me by a complete surprise, and it's something I never, ever dreamt of. And uh, it, it's a great honor, one that frankly feels quite, quite far beyond me, so I just want to say I'm, I'm grateful. And I also want to uh, mention some of the people who have been my mentors and collaborators over the years. I've got several of my family members, my parents, and my, uh, two of my siblings, my sister and brother, and his wife, and two of my children here with us, sitting here on the, just wave to the people. And, <laughs> and uh, Grateful to all of them and, and a number of people uh, here and at other universities who've been my collaborators over the years and my mentors and certainly to the uh, hundreds of undergraduate and graduate students um, that, that I've had in my lab over the years. All are, are greatly, greatly appreciated. Well, as far back as I can remember, I have loved science and wanted to be a scientist. My uh, father started working for the space program in about 1962, and uh, I was actively interested in that program and the rockets and flights to the planets and to the moon and all of that throughout my childhood and, and my youth. I also developed through that a great fascination with the concept of light. For Christmas, 1968, Santa Claus brought a chemistry set. <laughs> and I looked really hard on the internet to find the chemistry set that I received. This is, I think, the one that came out the year after. It, it's about as close as I could find to, to what, what came. And uh, I, I remember doing experiments with the chemistry set. Uh, the things I remember the most, it had a little plastic rocket. And you would, uh, in fact, I think the, is this a laser pointer? No. It is. All right. Yeah, I think I think right over there is the the plastic rocket. Anyway, you uh, you you put in some some sodium bicarbonate and a little bit of of, a, of an acid like vinegar and a little bit of uh, tissue paper and stick that thing down on the ground and it shoots up, you know, 20 feet in the air, and. Uh, I remember that, but the other thing that I remember doing a lot was that you can take different uh, mineral salts and uh, burn them in your little alcohol lamp and you get different colors depending on what the, what the salt is, whether it's potassium or whether it's uh, calcium or, or strontium, you get, you get different colors. And I, I thought that was, that was pretty cool. One of the memories that my parents will recognize is that I used to spend hours and hours walking around in the backyard, pacing is what we called it, and that's what it was, literally hours, and, uh, and I would sit there, I would walk around thinking and fantasizing about science. I'm not sure if my parents uh, know what it was I was thinking about. I may be telling them right now for the very first time. <laughs> There was a lot of things that I, that I used to think about, but one of them was about uh, uh, light. One of, one of my fantasies was to build a machine, or, or have a machine, that would have a, a television screen with it, and that it would use light to provide information about different things, different places or, or, or objects or minerals or chemicals or whatever. And uh, I, 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 would, I would think about that and fantasize about that and think how cool that would be. And, and of course, I didn't know anything about spectroscopy at the time. I didn't know that such a thing existed and had been invented long, long before me. And uh, 
but that ignorance all changed when I was a postdoc at the University of Virginia. Um, we, uh, our lab inherited a brand new state-of-the-art uh, fluorescent spectrometer uh, that uh, was, it was bought by the department and our lab had space for it, so it got put in our lab. And I decided I wanted to learn how to use this, this machine. And, uh, and so I did. And that was the beginning of a, a lifelong love affair, uh, which has, has brought much uh, happiness to me in the 30 years after that time. Um, by now, you're probably wondering, what does that have to do with my title? Which implied something about uh, the existence of God. Well, um, as you know, sometimes science is used as a basis for arguing that uh, God doesn't really exist. And, um, and all the stuff that goes with it, eternal life, spirits, answers to prayer, all that stuff. Um, not all scientists feel that way, of course. And it's not just scientists at BYU. Many are, are devout. But, uh, but, but some do, and, and others who are learning about science sometimes use science to argue that faith doesn't make any sense. It's not even rational. Uh, one of the strongest proponents of the idea that, that science supersedes faith is a, a sort of a science slash philosopher by the name of Richard Dawkins. Uh, back in England, he, uh, he has an institute of, for rational thought, and, and he argues quite strongly and, and vocally um, against the idea of, of faith in God. This is one of his famous quotes. He says, faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, or perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. And uh, I suppose it's probably not difficult to imagine scenarios which, for which that, uh, that quote would perhaps apply. The question for me, though, is this. Can one make a case for belief in God, not in spite of, but actually encouraged by a study of science? And uh, I, I think the answer is yes. Um, there are actually many scientists and philosophers who have attempted to make such arguments. And the points I will make today are not necessarily unique to me or new ones, um, and perhaps not as sophisticated as, as many of the arguments that have been made. But, but these, are, these are my arguments. These are personal ones. And uh, I just hope that uh, you might find the same thing that I do, that, that they're kind of interesting. So let's give it a whirl. Some of the questions that are raised in opposition to uh, religious belief um, based on science are, are, are ones like this. One is that it's just the whole idea is just too fantastic. It goes far beyond what we encounter or can measure scientifically for it to be believable. Uh, another example is that the whole thing's based on feelings. And how can feelings be accepted as evidence? Or how is it physically, and I'll get a little bit more specific, how is it physically possible for there to be eternal beings? How can God possibly keep track of all of us? How can he listen to and answer the simultaneous thoughts and prayers of billions? I would love to use science as a means to prove the existence of God. If you came here today, this may actually help with the seating situation. <laughs> if you came here today expecting that to be the case, then I would like to refer you to one of my favorite quotes from my all-time favorite movie, The Princess Bride, where Wesley told Inigo Montoya, get used to disappointment. <laughs> But instead, I think that science may help us decide that it is reasonable to believe in God. And uh, that's the, the point I would like to make today. And so, I'd like to connect it to light, first of all. Our journey begins with exploring the interesting, yet very strange properties of light. So, 
Some of this will be a review of your first course in physics uh, for, for some of you, and for others this might be a little bit new, but hopefully we'll quickly get into things that, that might capture your attention. Um, so light, uh, a beam of light appears to consist of a large number of very tiny particles called photons. In fact, demonstrating this particle nature of light was the basis of a Nobel Prize to Albert Einstein. Uh, near the beginning of the 20th century. And, and it can be demonstrated that if you just simply shoot a beam of photons at a detector, it detects them one at a time, little, little moments of energy that it detects that uh, uh, argue quite easily that uh, light is, consists of particles. However, if we take and we shoot a beam of light at a uh, at a surface that has a couple of slits in it. Now those slits uh, need to be, oh, about uh, a quarter of a centimeter apart from each other or a little bit closer, something like that. But, uh, you know, the, the, uh, several millimeters apart from each other they can be. If you shoot a beam of light at it, you get, instead of uh, two bars of light in the back, like you might imagine, you get a pattern. And it's called an interference pattern where there are lines of brightness and lines where there is no light. And the only way that you can get an interference pattern is if there is uh, waves. If you uh, put water through two slits like this, you will form some waves and there will be places where uh, the crests of the waves overlap with each other and that's the bright spots and places where the crest of one wave overlaps with the trough of another and they cancel each other out and that's the dark spots. And so this pattern suggests that light is also a wave. Now, people can say, well, how, how can it be both a particle and a wave? One analogy that is sometimes made is that it's like water, where you have particles of water, water molecules, and if you get a whole bunch of water molecules together, you can have waves. And they feel like that's an explanation of how it can be particle and waves at the same time. The answer is no, that's not the explanation. Because if we go back and repeat that experiment with the two slits, and this time we shoot the photons through one at a time, what you find is that you get spots on the, uh, on the back behind the slits, but if you wait for a couple of minutes, you find out that those spots recreate the interference pattern. And so what that means is it's not just that a bunch of light particles together collectively can form waves, it's that every particle of light is a wave. The particle itself is a wave, and even though the photon is tiny, and the distance between those two slits is billions and billions of times greater than the size of a photon, it's as though the individual photon goes through both slits <coughs> at the same time. And that's how you get that interference pattern. In fact, if we take one of the slits away and just have one and shoot the photons through, you get uh, images on the back behind the slit, but the interference pattern is gone. You only get the waves if you have two slits. And so light very much is both a particle and a wave individually at the same time. Now that explains the radiative properties of light, and that's, that's stuff that for many of you is, is not new. But did you know that light is involved in much, much more? Everything we experience physically in this life, everything involves light. The scripture puts it this way, the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed. How? Well, to, to understand that, we need to consider that all energy and matter in the universe appears to be governed by four fundamental forces. These forces are, number one, the electromagnetic force. This is the force of attraction between positive and negative charges and repulsion between charges that are the same, either positive, positive, or negative, negative. The second one is the gravitational force. The third one is the strong nuclear force. And the fourth one is the weak nuclear force. The strong nuclear force holds uh, the protons and neutrons and quarks in the nucleus together. And the weak nuclear force is the basis of radioactive decay. 
gravity, of course, you, you know what that is. Well, these forces have um, either always existed or they began at the beginning of the universe, which is uh, frequently refer referred to as the moment of the Big Bang. We can't really tell if the forces predated that. That becomes kind of a philosophical question, but they at least began with that. Well, everything that we experience physically involves the electromagnetic force. Even your ability to sense gravity because touch, when you touch something, you feel it. That's the electromagnetic force. Your ability to sense temperature, your ability to sense when you change direction or you move faster or slower, uh, your ability to sense pressure, your eyesight, your hearing, your sense of smell, your sense of taste, your nerve impulses themselves, your thoughts, your ideas, your emotions, feelings of pain, itch, tickle, I'm running out of things, sensation of gravity, I mentioned that already, everything, everything that you experience in life is because of light. In fact, all matter is held together by the electromagnetic force. Um, that's true in terms of the electrons around the nucleus in the atom. That's true for the chemical bonds in a molecule. That all is one way or another, the electromagnetic force. Uh, it's the electromagnetic force that holds water molecules together in, the, in a stream of water or in that glass of water. It's the electromagnetic force that holds the gas molecules together and, and segregates them from the water in the bubbles in the, in the glass. It's what holds us together. And I, I, can, I always, every time I give a talk, there always involves some picture of my wife and I scuba diving. That's <laughs> the two of us on vacation last summer. Well, every force, every one of those fundamental forces has what's called a mediator, or sometimes it's called a carrier of the force. The force is not just some invisible thing, but there's actually something that carries that force from one object to another, the two objects that are acting on each other. So we can think about that in terms of the electromagnetic force. We take a positively charged object like the nucleus of an atom, and we take a negatively charged object like an electron, they're attracted to each other, right? Positive and negative charges are attracted to each other. Well, how does this work? It turns out <coughs> that both the electron as well as that nucleus are repeatedly emitting very, very tiny particles. The particles move out from the, the source, from either that nucleus or that electron, and they they immediately, after they move out from it, return to it. In fact, they, they can only exist for a very brief moment because their very existence is forbidden by the first law of thermodynamics. You can't create matter or energy, and yet those little particles are kind of energetic and they're momentarily created, and so they must immediately disappear. Um, they have a name, they're called bosons. Well, it turns out that every once in a while, one of those particles, instead of returning to the uh, object that emitted it, it gets transferred to the other one. And so it ends up getting shared between them. And it turns out that it's the sharing of those bosons that is the basis of the force. And that's what tracks that positive and negative to each other. And when they're the same charge, then that's, that's how they're repelled. Well, that, there's a specific boson for each of the different fundamental forces, and the name of the boson for the electromagnetic force is the photon. Or in other words, it's light that is mediating that force. That light is the base of that force. That's what's being emitted and received between the two objects is light. So light is in everything from atoms to the cosmos. And it is, in fact, the law governing those things. And of course, it is the giver of life. We know this in the life sciences, don't we? And so everything that we call real depends on things that we feel through light. In fact, your ability to determine um, what the source of something is 
that, that you feel or that you touch, your ability to determine that is because you feel it. And so it ends up being kind of a circular reasoning. We feel this because we feel it. We know it's there because we feel it. How do we know it's there? Because we feel it. That's the best argument we got for reality. And so all that we look around the room, we see each other, we see the pictures, we see the slides, all that stuff is just our brain's ability to map out what we're sensing through the electromagnetic force uh, as involving light. So you see that scripture from the Doctrine and Covenants is more than a metaphor. It stated quite exactly what the role of light actually is. Well, since everything that we feel is transmitted in the same way, whether it's emotions or whether it is things that we touch and see, why should we dismiss faith because it's based on evidence that we feel when feeling is the only thing that we can do? And it all involves exactly the same physics. I would also argue that if reality is as strange and unexplored as I've described, how can we be so arrogant as to dismiss God because he seems foreign to experience? As you already I hope you recognize that none of what I told you about the role of light is something that you experience or you know, know about directly, other than your faith in me <laughs> telling you that it's true. It's also on Wikipedia, so... <laughs> well, let's get a little bit more philosophical about things. So here's our brain, you know, and uh, the thinking is this. If everything that we feel, sense, believe, touch, all that stuff is, is just the electromagnetic force and involving light transmission between interacting objects, that means that you can trace everything that happens back to something that's, that started it, that initiated it, stimulated it. And you can keep following the thread backwards, and it goes back to the Big Bang. And the thinking is that every thought we have, every action, everything that occurs started with the Big Bang, and it's just a big complicated thread weaving its way back to that. Or it's also conceded that it can begin as some kind of a random fluctuation, and those kinds of things can act on us as well. And that describes us in entirety. Well, if everything that we represent, everything that we feel like we are, can be traced back to the Big Bang or to random events, then what we think to be independent thought or free will is just an illusion because we don't know enough to see all the way to trace it back to, to the beginning. And so that begs, an, that, excuse me, that begs an important question for us. Does agency really exist? Or is it just an illusion? Um, my favorite definition of agency comes from 2 Nephi chapter 2. It's actually mentioned more than once there, but one place is in verse 26 where it talks about acting for themselves and not to be acted upon. And so tracing everything back to either random events or back to the Big Bang, that's saying everything is acted upon and nothing acts for itself. So that's the question. Do we really have the power to act or is everything, including us, always acted upon? Well, consider this logic. If agency really exists, if we really do have the power to act independently for ourselves, if we really do have the ability to conceive of an idea and make a decision that is not us simply in some sophisticated way being acted upon, then that concept of agency has got to be older than the Big Bang. It either has to have started before the Big Bang or it had to exist always. Otherwise, it's just another effect of the Big Bang and only an illusion. So that's what I'm saying. If agency is real, it has to have started before all, that, all those physics that I mentioned to you. 
Otherwise, it's an illusion. Well, if agency had to exist before the universe, you can't have agency if there's no agent. So there has to be an agent that's just as old as the agency. So perhaps that's God. Chapter 14, it says, Now, my sons, I speak unto you these things for your profit and learning, for there is a God. And he hath created all things, both the heavens and the earth, and all things that in them are, both things to act and things to be acted upon. Well, if we really believe that agency exists, true agency, then every time we exercise it, we're bearing witness to ourselves that God exists. When we exercise our agency to be disobedient, we may think that we're acting, but in fact we're choosing to be acted upon. We're simply yielding ourselves to the physical influences that may be. And as the scriptures put it, we're, we're choosing captivity, choosing simply to be acted upon. When we, make, when we focus on exercising our agency to make choices based on what's right, to act rather than simply being acted upon, we start to sense more and more um, through the power of the Holy Ghost, I'm sure, I'm sure, that eternal kernel that is in us all. If we simply allow ourselves to be purely reactionary to other, infor other influences, then that connection with the eternal fades. Therefore, active obedience is a demonstration of faith and it builds faith. And every act of obedience connects us with the choice we made prior to coming to this earth, the choice to be agents. Um, and in fact then, as we're here in mortality, trying to be obedient, we may think that we're, we're here to prove our worth to Heavenly Father. He already knows what we're worth. What we're doing is we're proving his existence to ourselves by acting in obedience. And then, of course, it would make sense that the atonement of Jesus Christ would be the ultimate act of agency and therefore the ultimate uh, witness that God exists. This is one way in which it glorifies the Father. And of course, the, the opposite, Lucifer's hope to destroy the agency, would have naturally destroyed that connection to God and stolen the glory. Thus, Lehi argues correctly, without opposition and the ability to choose whether to act or to be acted upon, there is no God. That's what he says. And I think he's right. Every act of true altruistic obedience, every sacrifice, every demonstration of faith contrary to natural law is therefore a witness of God. And the more we act in this fashion, the more we will know that he's truly there. Thus, the natural man, allowing himself to be influenced solely by the influences of natural law and personal um, the desires and so forth that come with it, becomes an enemy to God. I also like this scripture from Section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants. All truth is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it to act for itself as all intelligence also. Otherwise, there is no existence. So that connection of agency and choice to the very existence of God uh, seems to prevail <coughs> scripturally. Well, okay. How can he be personal with billions of us? The answer is, short answer, I don't know. <laughs> no, nobody knows. But here's some fun things to consider that may at least be metaphors for it. I also mentioned that the gravitational force is um, one of the fundamental forces. It's uh, frankly quite a, quite a strange force if you, if you think about it. Um, you all know that we're, we're, uh, we're all attracted to the earth 
And uh, so is every other bit of matter, large and small. It's all attracted to the Earth through gravity. What you may not know is that we're also all attracted to every other bit of matter. We're attracted to each other. We're attracted to the chairs you're sitting in, attracted to the floor, not just the Earth, but the floor as well. Uh, I'm attracted to this microphone. It's going to suck me in any time. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's, that's how it works. Gravity works on everything, on everyone and everything. We're all simultaneously connected to every other bit of matter through gravity, as is every bit of matter connected to uh, all the others as well as to the, to the Earth. Well, how could that be? Well, it turns out that it works perhaps kind of similar, that uh, the Earth and us are emitting little particles, little bosons, and every once in a while they get shared and that attracts us to, to the Earth. And uh, we've even got a name for them. They're called gravitons. That's the boson for the force of gravity. And that all seems wonderful. Seems like, okay, same explanation as the electromagnetic force. Well, wrong. Gravity is not the same in that way. And uh, maybe I can just remind you of three differences between gravity and the electromagnetic force that might ha give you a little bit of feel for how it's somehow different. First off, remember with the electromagnetic force, there are particles that attract each other because they have opposite charge, and there is also repulsion. With gravity, it's not charge that determines the force of the attraction, it's mass, right? The more mass, the more gravitational force, but it's always attractive. There's no such thing as anti-gravity. Okay, there's no, no repulsion. Nobody has to worry that tomorrow they'll step out of bed and fly toward the ceiling. A second difference is that with the electromagnetic force, a barrier hijacks the force. Uh, so we got the, uh, the, the linebacker here who's trying to tackle the, the ball carrier, uh, but the fullback gets in the way. And so even though the uh, linebacker wanted to go share photons with the, uh, the guy carrying the ball, he ended up, perhaps against his will, sharing the photons instead with the, with the fullback, blocking him. In other words, if you put a barrier between two uh, objects that might be attracted to each other, they become attracted or repelled by the barrier rather than by each other. So you can hijack it by simply interfering. That's not true with gravity. Um, the guy that's in the air is coming down, even though there's somebody in the way. And so gravity, if you think about it, It never can experience a barrier. As, as I stand here on the floor, the attraction to the center of the earth is coming right through the building, right through the parking garage, right up through the floor to me. And the same is true for you, right through the chair. You're simultaneously attracted to the chair, the floor, the parking garage, and the, and the center of the earth. And so they're all sharing these gravitons back and forth, and they never get confused. You never start, uh, start getting them confused uh, and, and sharing with what was unintended like you do with the electromagnetic force. The third thing is, is that the gravitational force is extremely weak compared to um, the electromagnetic force. That's why it's always a mystery until the final moment whether the pass will be caught or not. Otherwise, the ball would just simply stick immediately to the player, helmet, wherever, and, of course, the player wouldn't notice that because he would be laying flat on the ground uh, because the gravity would be so strong, it, it just, it, everything would just collapse down. So gravity is extremely weak. Well, so this is where it gets weird. A popular theory, this is probably the most, the most accepted theory right now, argues that bosons and other particles, so the photons, the gravitons, uh, the other ones, um, are analogous to one-dimensional strings rather than points in space. And some strings are open strings. The photon would be an example. And other strings are closed strings, like the graviton. And the fact that one's open and the other's closed somehow explains the difference. Um, now, if you're, if you're starting to think quickly about follow-up questions that you're going to ask me about this, please understand that I am currently telling you everything I know about the subject. <laughs> uh, it doesn't take much to get beyond one's ability to get abstract. 
Okay, so you're with me? We got, we got the open strings, that's the photons, that's the light, that's what's attracting to each other with uh, the electromagnetic force. We got the gravitons, the closed strings. Well, the open strings can be described in the same three dimensions of space, you know, the dimension of up, down, side to side, back to front, those three dimensions, plus the dimension of time, so we can move those coordinates through time. Those four dimensions are sufficient to describe light and photons. The graviton mathematically requires at least 10 dimensions, and as many in some theories as 26. So six more dimensions uh, beyond the, the four ones that we're familiar with. And, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to wrap your head around that. Here is something, a diagram called a Cabal-Yau manifold. That's supposed to help you wrap your head <laughs> around the six additional dimensions. Um, okay, good. You, you laughed at the right time. Thank you. <laughs> So the more we investigate it, the concept of gravity becomes increasingly strange, confusing, and unbelievable, and yet it's right here. We experience it all the time. Here it is. So why is it so hard to believe that, that, uh, that we have a God who's connected to all of us? Listen to the metaphor. Gravity extends out from the earth to each, reach each of us individually. Heavenly Father's love does exactly the same thing, emanating from Him. It's personal. Gravity is. It's a little different for each of us. If you don't believe it, take turns stepping on the scales, <laughs> where you can measure the force quite accurately. And so is Heavenly Father's love. It's very personal. When we change, as you will experience as you get older, it adjusts to match us. It's a force that's unseen. It can only be felt. You see the metaphor? You see how similar? Um, it's an unlimited supply. It doesn't matter how many people are born into the world. There's always enough for everyone. It passes right through things and touches us. There's no physical barrier that can prevent it. The only way its influence grows weaker is to distance ourselves. But when we come back, it's right there waiting for us. Therefore, even though we might not be constant, it is constant. Doesn't matter whether we believe it's there or not, it's still there. Well, my journey in science began 41 years ago when I stepped into the Irene Science Center, 8 a.m., Chem 105, Elliot Butler. Some of you in this room remember him, great educator. It's been a wonderful journey ever since then. I really enjoyed it, and I'm grateful. Grateful to have had that chance. Well, thank you for indulging me as I share with you some of the interesting things that strengthen my belief that believing in God is not anti-science, but in fact encouraged by it. Don't know if you buy any of my arguments or not. That's up to you. But I just want to go on record as saying one last time, my 41 years of formal study of science has not weakened my faith in God. In fact, it has strengthened it. And I'll just close by saying, mahalo. Uh, Jim, do we do questions at these things or? Okay, as long as it's not about open and closed strings. <laughs> um, sir, you said, you said that light um, governs all things, but um, what about, what about um, matter such as a dark matter, which doesn't interact electromagnetically? It makes up over 90% of the matter. So, um, so that, that's, that's, a, that's a reasonable question, and a lot of what we know about dark matter, or, well, there's a lot we don't know about dark matter. And so it's, it's really difficult for me to, to get into that. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly the gravitational force is, is, is a big part of, of what's involved there. Um, what I, what I uh, was, was trying to argue was that everything that we experience is... is experience. 
governed by the electromagnetic force. So you 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 may uh, you may have an important case there. I I don't know. I'm not sure anybody does to what extent the electromagnetic force is involved with dark matter. We don't even know the nature of it, except it's dark. Yes. <laughs> Sure, of course. And what, what, do you have a method? <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's the same method as, as, as everybody else. I, I investigate and uh, I experience things that I, that I feel and uh, they, that, that feeling of intelligence sort of flowing in and, and those, those feelings that uh, give you peace and confidence that something is right. Same as everybody else. What I'm arguing is that those feelings are not to be discounted because there are feelings. Because feeling is all we do. And fundamentally, there's no difference. They're, they're, they're not distinguishable when you get down to the physics level. Yes? So, you know, we talked about how the world either be modeled or described as events ranging from the Big Bang or um, quantum randomness in your brain. Um, and then we, we kind of jump or, or random events that are external that act on you. Okay. And then we, we jump to agency. And I, I get that, you know, we as, um, we, we like to think we're the captain of our own soul and that we have agency. But um, why, why can't we model the world as random events or things coming from the Big Bang? We can. So why do we have to have agency then? Um, the, the, uh, so I, I, I crafted the argument very carefully. I said, if agency exists, then it has to predate the other, if it really exists. And, and so, so it becomes a philosophic question. It actually becomes the stuff of poets and philosophers rather than the stuff of, of scientists, whether or not agency exists. And so what I'm arguing is that the question, is there God, is actually the question is, do we have free will or not? Um, but that, so that's the reason why every act that's, that uh, seems, you know, altruistic, contrary to the influences on us, every act where we uh, truly feel like we're exercising our free will um, strengthens our, our faith in God. But, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it remains faith in that way. Yes? It's a great question. I mean, we could say it's the stakes that motivate one. You know, that's like saying, okay, if it's true, it means so much, I, I'm, I'm going to get on board. That, that's, that's certainly one way of looking at it. That, that's not the way, that may have been the way it used to be for me. It's not the way that it is now. Um, but, but instead, what it is, is the, it's the preponderance of evidence of the type we described in the, with the earlier question that. Uh, that uh, that becomes the basis of my motivation to continue on. Yes. I just wanted to add one. You described through what you talked about the light, light all things. From my understanding, from what the president also said, what God does, we cannot do more than what He does. For example, God is someone who has the highest power and highest authority. Powerful resurrection because a man don't have that power, the body has to go through God. 
So having agency um, to act and being able to act in any way that you like are not the same thing, right? But, but the agency is moral agency, though. For example, like what he said, was it all the qualified the highest in their life is only to explain to give a commandment. Like what he said about the light, you talk about the sunlight, that make us reflect the feeling. But the one he's talking about the law, that's how you keep the qualified for the highest, though, who's in the life, though. Hmm. Good comment. I think we have to let a class come in here. We've got yeah. a class in here. So let's thank Dr. Bell again.